Good evening. Uh, welcome again to the Canadian Orthodox Monastery of All Saints of North America. And I promised to continue reading uh, a little bit of an expose of the Toll House cult. Uh, and I'm going to read this evening, well, from this book, which, uh, of course, is available, actually available free to anyone who will email us and ask for it. And we will actually send you the whole collection of four books that have been written to uh, refute this soul-destroying teaching of aerial toll houses. And I'm going to start this evening with a section of this book by uh, uh, Presbytera Irene Mata, who belongs to the Greek Archdiocese in America, and um, whose education uh, is quite deep. She's a master of theology. And her uh, thesis was on Saint Irénée of Lyon, his refutation of all heresies. And so I'm going to read from her segment of this book that um, would help to enlighten us about the really the falsehoods and sort of premeditated falsehoods that the uh, Ariel Tollhouse cult leaders and uh, devotees put forth to try to defend this indefensible teaching. A teaching that comes from folk religion and goes back to pagan Kaldia with the uh, the story of Easter or Yanana. And uh, we, we want to uh, look at it and trace the history of it and its development. So Irene Mata's uh, chapter or segment in this book is one of the best places that we can start. And I won't read the preface to it. We'll start with uh, chapter 2, Toll Houses, Gates of Hades. A. Claims of Profound Antiquity. The statement of Toll House advocates that the aerial Toll House tradition has been preserved with varying detail, details from profound antiquity is certainly borne out by a study of ancient pagan fertility cults. One would hope that this is not what they were referring to, but there is no doubt that the origin of the Ariel Tollhouse myth is taken from ancient pagan mythology via the Gnostic cults and sects. The Chaldeans are the source of most of the creation myths of the Near East, possessing an infectious religion that eventually spread to neighboring countries in the Middle East and Egypt. Their myths formed a religious framework for many of these cultures. Because the Canaanites shared this seductive religion, the Israelites were commanded by God to avoid them when Israel came into the Promised Land. The new Israel, the Holy Church, must also eradicate and expel from herself those who import their superstitions, potent enticements, for those with a firm faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. B. Yanana's descent into Hades. The ancient Chaldean tale of the toll houses relates the story of Queen Yanana, mythical queen of Sumer, and her descent into the underworld to rescue her deceased spouse. She is called Easter in Canaan, Demeter in Greece, Ceres or Persephone, daughter of Ceres, in Rome, to name only a few cultures which adapted this myth. On her journey into Hades, Queen Ianana passed through gates, paying a bribe of jewelry or delicate garments to each gatekeeper. Various demons punished her with plagues at these toll houses, until she paid the price for her lost husband. Both she and her consort then ascended out of the realm of death into life again. This myth and others patterned after it explain the death of vegetation in the winter and the renewed life in springtime. While Inanna was below in Hades, there was winter on earth. When Inanna ascended to life again, 
she brought fertility and springtime with her in order to assure the reappearance of spring each year. This fertility goddess was worshipped with special rituals. Heaven replaces Hades. The toll houses or gates described in the myth were originally in a subterranean labyrinth. Gnostic cults of the first century AD inverted the labyrinth, moving its location into the heavens in order to adapt it more easily to Christian doctrines. And I, I want to add parenthetically here that the Chaldeans also actually had developed a kind of aerial toll house idea because they perceived there to be seven planets, which is where we, and one could ascend through the astral planes of the seven planets by passing through the archons or demons of the toll gates between the uh, gates into the astral realms. And when one ascended to the seventh segment, the seventh planet, one had ascended to seventh heaven, which is where we get the expression seventh heaven. But at each of these aerial toll gates, you had to defend yourself against an accusation of some kind, or know the magic word, or have the price that the priest had given you to pay your way through. Sort of like having your elder pray you through the toll gates. Now, uh, an ascent to God instead of a descent was hypothesized by those who had true gnosis, leading to their salvation from the evil creation of the Old Testament God. Only those with secret knowledge of the magical incantations could come through the aerial gates guarded by archons, evil powers, safely and arrive to equality with the Most High Spirit. Originally, there were seven of these spheres or astral planes, one for each of the known planets of ancient Chaldean cosmology. The toll stations were stationed at a passage between each of these seven spheres or astral planes. It is from this myth that we get the common expression of the seventh heaven. Gnostics, contenders against the faith, chapter 3. Gnosticism, from the Greek gnos gnosis, knowing, teaches salvation through special knowledge, which is composed of Greek and other pagan myths, expressed with a mixture of pagan and Christian terminology. Church fathers addressed this heresy because Gnostics, claiming to be Christians, would insinuate themselves into Christian communities, as they still do. Yet they held to pagan understandings and definitions. Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, one of the chief adversaries among the fathers, complained that Gnostics would say the creed while harboring their own definitions of its proclamations. He exposed their myths in detail, including their aerial toll house, a part of Gnosticism's syncretized system. Gnostic believers learned special incantations and secret revelations from their leaders so that the archons, evil demons, would let them pass through on their ascent. Eventually, the soul would pass into the highest heaven and equality with the Most High God. A secret knowledge. Gnosticism, both the ancient and modern versions, used knowledge of secret laws to gain salvation. They often claim a secret knowledge of an invisible world, which they can reveal piecemeal to others. In fact, the early Gnostics worshipped the serpent, Believing its lie to Adam, you shall be like God. Gnosticism has from the beginning of the church, even until today, seduced many believers away from repentance and the personal relationship with Jesus Christ, from grace to special laws. Often, as in ancient Gnosticism, a guru or spiritual guide is elevated to a special place in the cult. He reveals secrets about the becoming about becoming divine from his supposed visions of revelations. 
This is the reason that the fathers of the faith warn continually against belief in dreams and visions. They are used by the enemy to lead us into spiritual pride and delusion. St. Irenaeus' words stand today as a warning against the followers of the imaginary toll houses. Quote, Those who declare themselves perfect and as being possessed of knowledge of all things are found to be worse than the heathen and to entertain more blasphemous opinions even against their own creator. Gnostic toll houses are heavenly gates. St. Irene of Lyon, who was in 180 AD, described the heavenly gates of the archons or powers in his work against heresies. The Gnostic believer was taught that various magic formulae to use at death, as the soul separates from the body, and rises in an upward journey toward godness. Condemning this teaching, he writes, quote, Using the above-named invocations, the person may become incapable of being seized upon by principalities and powers, so that their inner man may ascend on high as their body in death is left among the created things of this world. Gnostics teach that when the devil, an evil angelic, uh, and evil angelic uh, companions of the demiurge, their creator, hear their incantations, they are greatly agitated and overcome. Salvation belongs to the soul alone, so they teach. St. Isaac the Syrian adds, quote, this convicts the false writings called revelations, which being composed by the originators of corrupt heresies under the influence of demonic fantasies, describe the celestial dwelling in the sky, the pathways to heaven, places set apart for judgment, manifold figures of hosts in the sky, and their diverse activities. But all these things are shadows of a mind inebriated by conceit and deranged by the workings of demons. For this very reason, the blessed Paul, by one word, closed the door in the face of this theoria, and the exclusion thereof he anchored in silence. For even if the mind were able to disclose that which belongs to the realm of the spirit, it would not receive permission to do so. For he said that all divine visions, which the tongue has power to disclose in the physical realm, are fantasies of the soul's thoughts, not the working of grace. May your holiness, therefore, keeping these things in mind, beware of the fantasies of profound thoughts. This warfare especially assaults monks, who are keen-witted, who inquire into empty opinions, yearn for novelties, and are superficial. The perpetrator of the mo modern Gnostic heresy in the Church, Father Seraphim Rose's Gnostic teaching, also claims that the soul alone is able to attain salvation without the body's participation. As, any Greek, uh, as in any Greek philosophy, the soul in Gnostic teaching is a real, complete human person. The body is merely a house, a shell, or often a prison for the person soul to inhabit. This perspective is pagan and thoroughly non-Orthodox. C. The Gnostic myth of Elder Basil the New and Theodora. Archbishop Lazar Puhalo's work, The Tale of Elder Basil Anew and the Theodora Myth, Study of a Gnostic Document, is a vital contribution to the liturgy on this topic. Evidently, this myth has been transformed into the story of a, quote, Saint Theodora, end quote, appearing in several hagiographies in, in the tale, he traces the origins of its after-death concepts to the Gnostic Paulicians. Paulicians were a militaristic Manichaean sect 
which migrated into northern Greece from Armenia in the early 7th century. The person recounting the Theodora tale, Gregory of Thrace, lived in this area. The myth identifies the numbers of the toll houses, called torments, through which the soul must pass after leaving the body. The following quote from Theodora's, quote, experience, end quote, as recorded by Gregory, reveals its Gnostic premises that salvation of the soul can transpire after death apart from the body. Theodora speaks of the, quote, first torment, end quote. There I saw recorded all my angry words, foul words, wild laughter, the evil spirits accused me of all this. Now I kept silent, because the evil spirit accused me rightly. But the holy angel offered some of my good deeds, and they added something from the treasure given me by the holy man Basil, and thus they paid my debts at this station. There are heretical presuppositions, presuppositions in her words. The holy angel offer her good deeds as payment for her sins without reference to the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and her debts were paid in a juridical transaction, reflecting the Western view of merits stored for payment for temporal punishment due to sin, a construct of Western scholasticism. Contrary to this notion, the Christian's hope is in the mercy of God, in Christ, since we cannot possibly pay anything. Our Lord Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sins as we repent of them. In the fourth torment of this tale, Theodora tells us that, quote, He who does not strive to cleanse his sins by good deeds cannot escape the dark tormentors, end quote. Good deeds are nothing in the sight of God except when done as an expression of faith in Christ. However, faith is never mentioned in this fairy tale. Faith is never mentioned in this tale. Neither is divine grace, by the way. However, faith is never mentioned in this fairy tale. Instead, there is an implied doubt that Christ's redemption is adequate for the sinner. This is simply superstition dressed up in pious terminology. The Orthodox Christian knows that if we belong to Christ, St. Paul's assurance is for us. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In his epistle to the Romans, he writes, Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Lord himself promises, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the ages. What then is there for the Christian believer to fear? And we'll continue this, the next chapter, in our next reading session. Uh, we'll, we're also going to deal with a, some verses in Scripture, which Tollhausers falsify, literally falsify, in order to claim that uh, Apostle Paul is telling us that we have to pass through aerial toll houses struggling with principalities and powers of the air, where the Holy Fathers understand the verse in a, a completely different way. Again, there's no mention of the aerial toll houses or anything even vaguely resembling them anywhere in Scripture, nowhere. And nothing like this aerial judgment seats is mentioned where they would absolutely be mentioned if they were part of Orthodox Christian teaching in the funeral service. Think about it. If, if we believed for a moment that the soul was struggling in perilous danger, going through aerial toll houses after it departed the body, and evidently they uh, never read the Holy Fathers about the meaning of the memorial services, but say, they're struggling through aerial toll houses for 40 days. Brothers and sisters, if that were the case, if such a dangerous thing were taking place, 
Can you imagine that it would not be mentioned in any of the memorial services or prayers for the dead that are offered in the Orthodox Church? That's unimaginable. Anyway, we'll continue with our reading uh, a little later. So thank you and God bless you. Thanks for joining us.